Welcome to the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. In the last episode, the one on Plotinus, we talked a little bit about the upward way. That's the way of living where your chief concern is never the material stuff of this world, including even your own health, ultimately. Instead, if you follow the upward way, your main concern is with God and righteousness. We're going to talk more about that in this episode in two different ways. First, I'm going to talk about what your earthly reward might be if you follow the upward way, and then... We'll talk about what your earthly reward might be if you follow the way of descent. These two different ways will be called philosophy, which names the upward way, and sophistry, or rhetoric, which Socrates says is a branch of pandering, and which, according to him, is one of the presumably manifold ways of descent. Also, by the way, in the last episode, I forgot to splice in excerpts from the text, which made already difficult content probably even more difficult. You can still watch it again with the captions on, and because I'm so good at enunciating, the auto-captions will help you read along if you want. But press 1 in the chat if you think it's worth the 15 minutes or so that it takes for me to post the excerpts as part of the video, And I guess I'll keep doing it if you keep liking the videos and telling your latest girlfriends to subscribe. Okay, kings? Okay. Here's something Socrates says in the Gorgias Dialogue that I think is among the most perfect things he ever said. And you probably haven't heard it before. Quote, What I say is not designed to please, and I aim not at what is most agreeable, but at what is best. This, again, is what we're calling the upward path, the way of philosophy. Socrates says this while he's talking to Callicles in the second half of the Gorgias Dialogue, in a long digression about whether pleasure is good, and whether satiating your desires is good, and whether unrestrained power to kill or steal or take whatever you want is good, and so on. Callicles makes fun of Socrates here, accuses him of being impractical when he claims, when Socrates claims, that unrestrained license to kill and take whatever you want isn't actually a good. Callicles says, more or less, you better hope you don't get called into court, Socrates, because you won't be able to give them a defense. And here's where it gets really interesting. Socrates basically agrees with him. He says, continuing, same page, all this stuff. He says, quote, Because I aim not at what is most agreeable, but at what is best, and will not employ the subtle arts which you advise, I shall have no defense to offer in a court of law. I can only repeat what I was saying to Polus. Now, Polus is one of the other interlocutors here on this dialogue. He's, he's taking the side of Gorgias. And here, Socrates tells one of the finest, finest little analogies in his entire orations. I want you to really picture this. This is right up there with the the, uh, allegory of the cave, in my view. So here's what he says, and and I'm going to put this on your screen, so look and read along. Socrates says, quote, If I'm called to court, I shall be like a doctor brought before a tribunal of children at the suit of a confectioner, like a a candy shop owner, right? Imagine what sort of defense a man like that could make before such a court if he were accused in the following terms. Children, the accused has committed a number of crimes against you. He is the ruin of even the youngest among you with his surgery and cautery. He reduces you to a state of helpless misery by choking you with bitter drafts and inflicting upon you a a regime of starvation, which cuts you off from food and drink. What a contrast to the abundant and varied luxury with which I, the confectioner, have entertained you. Imagine that's the charge in court against the doctor. What do you think, Socrates says, what do you think that the doctor could find to say in such a plight if he were to utter the truth and tell the children that he had done all these things in the interest of their health? 
Think of the prodigious, prodigious outcry that a court so constituted would raise. If, and it's a big if, but if there were any real teachers left in institutional education, this is the kind of short parable that they should force children to almost memorize. Have them memorize it early because they can, they, like, before they can even understand it, if they get it into their brains, then have them, you know, draw pictures of it, write acrostics summarizing so that they can remember this when they get older, whatever. The parable could be an absolute moral time bomb in the best possible way. Let's think about what it teaches. There are three figures in the parable. A doctor who is a master of the art of health. A confectioner who is literally just a candy man, who has a knack for giving children whatever they want. And then the mass of, you know, generic children, right? Now, because of the lead up to this story, in the context of the discussion in the Gorgias, it's plain and obvious that Socrates imagines himself as the equivalent of the doctor. And the orators also known as the rhetors or the sophists or the yeah the the speakers right the uh, and the confectioners these are the ones known as the confectioners in the parable and last of all the children and the children are of course like the normies the the masses of people the, we don't really need to say much about the children in the parable or about the normies there's not much to say i mean what are they doing? They're basically watching cable news, graduating from state schools with 2.9 GPAs, and then working in cubicles until they die, eating Subway sandwiches on their 15-minute lunch break, cheering for their local sports teams, wearing masks, getting the vaccine, etc., etc. They're so far from understanding anything about metaphysics or ontology or theology or reality or transcendent truths that we don't really need to think much more about them, except to note that in America, as in Athens, they vote, right? So, haha. I mean, that's sort of jokes on us, I guess. But let's think about the confectioner first. According to the parable, this equates to the sophist, to Gorgias himself, or to Callicles, or to any number of famous writers of classical Athens. Here is a list of some of their names cobbled together from various dialogues. I'll put it on the screen. In general, these guys made their money by talking. As I already hinted, I associate them with both news pundits and professional educators, primarily, who both, I mean, many of you will agree with me, not all of you, of course, but many of you will agree with me, both classes of people here, make a living from telling lies, basically. Many of them opened private schools, these ancient orators, where, you know, or at least like the, um, I almost said the best among them, but in a way it's like the worst among them, the most effective among them, opened private schools where they would instruct whoever paid them enough to uh, procure their services how to win whatever argument they wanted doesn't matter what the argument is, you understand, uh, that the client wanted to win. The sophist would help them, you know, if the price was right, win the argument. Now, already you may see the, the sort of moral problem here. Namely, you, you know, like, would you teach a person how, for example, to convince his parents to kill themselves or something equally heinous? Well, I mean, we'll get to this in a minute, but like the sophist has no problem with that for a certain fee, okay? That's gross, but that's what sophistry does. Now, w when we get to this further down the line, maybe we can, you know, and you guys in the chat or in the comments, we can discuss, am I with Socrates kind of caricaturing or hatefully exaggerating what it is to be a sophist or a rhetor or a CNN pundit? But that's the definition that Socrates sort of sticks to. And think again about the confectioner. I mean, have you ever been, in, like in literal terms, you ever been to one of those candy shops? They have to sell their candies to make money. And, like, they do feel that they need money. So they sell the candy. None of them believe that what they're selling actually produces health in children. And yet, the children will always come to the candy shop. And 
idiot parents, you know, themselves interestingly represented by children within this parable, they will bring the children to the candy shop. Nobody ever gets mad at a candy shop owner or at a confectioner or at a sophist because a sophist has a knack for giving people delight by stringing together words. Okay, but now think about Socrates, who imagines himself as a kind of doctor. A doctor is one who practices the art of healing and health. I should say here, Socrates distinguishes between an art, which is like a, a discipline, a thing you need knowledge to accomplish, and what he calls a knack, which, you know, cookery, or confection, or, or like just making people happy by, you know, like, like comedy. Even he says tragedy, the poets. This is all sort of, you have a knack, but it's not really, it's not an art, because it doesn't come from knowledge, but from something else less reliable, probably. So, uh, like, for example, a doctor, Socrates says, makes men better and keeps them in good health, right? Now, the only question is, does giving people candy, which equates to, you know, strings of words that produce delight, does this produce and maintain good health? In other words, is it good for people? And the answer is, of course not. What is good for people is having the discipline to say no to candy. What produces health is avoiding sugar. What makes you fit is preferring nutrient-dense foods, moderate exercise, and plenty of water and sleep. The point, I hope you gather easily enough now, is that the kinds of words that make men better, that bring their souls to health, and that facilitate better living, these words sound an awful lot like eat your Brussels sprouts sound to children, right? When those children are standing just outside a candy shop and the confectioner is inviting them in. If the Brussels sprouts doctor continues berating the children and urging them to turn away from the candy, eventually, if there are sufficient numbers of these children, they'll probably accuse the doctor of corrupting them and take him to court and make him drink the hemlock. And so Socrates concludes that parable by saying, quote, Well, that is the situation in which I am sure I shall find myself if I come before a court of law. I shall not be able to point to any pleasures that I have provided for my judges, the only kind of service and good, uh, sorry, the only kind of service and good turn that they recognize. And keep in mind, his judges are the people, the demos, the children in this parable, right? In this parable, Socrates shows that he knows very well that people do not enjoy hearing him speak. He even knows that they might eventually turn on him and try to kill him. But he keeps telling them what they need to hear to get healthy. Because he is a follower of the upward path. Because he is a philosopher and not a sophist. A sophist sells candy. A sophist stays in his lane. A sophist deals with the real world, keeps his head down. A sophist makes compromises. A sophist pays his bills, pays his taxes. A sophist knows what opinions make you popular, and he holds those opinions. And everybody loves him, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow. Okay. Enough of that. Now, let's connect that little bit to the more direct part of the Gorgias dialogue, the part where Socrates is discussing the nature of sophistry, which he also calls oratory, and which is now, at least in academia, generally referred to as rhetoric, with like a capital R. But while we're paused here, I just want to show you how um, the very modern writers of Wikipedia frame this perennial contest between philosophy and sophistry. Here's a little quote from the page on Gorgias. For almost all of Western history, Gorgias has been a marginalized and obscure figure in both philosophical thought and culture at large. In the 19th century, however, writers such as the German philosopher Hegel and the English classicist Grote 
began to work to rehabilitate Gorgias and the other sophists from their long-standing reputation as unscrupulous charlatans who taught people how to persuade others using rhetoric for unjust causes. As early as 1872, the English philosopher Henry Sidgwick was already calling this the old view. Modern sources continue to affirm that the old stereotype of the sophists is not accurate. What clown world we live in now. I, 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 your host, of, co of course, hope to rehabilitate the view that the sophists are indeed unscrupulous charlatans. Mountebanks, even. But I expect that if I have too much success framing it that way, I'll eventually have to drink the hemlock. What a shame. The dialogue begins with a bunch of guys inviting Socrates to hear Gorgias speak. Gorgias has promised to answer any question anyone puts. And everyone knows Socrates loves to ask questions, so they all anticipate a prize fight. So the conversation begins gradually by asking, what sort of man is Gorgias? And what the Socratic side means by that question is, well, if a man practices the art of healing and health, we call him a doctor. And if he makes pictures, we call him a painter. So very quickly the question becomes, what is the art in which Gorgias is an expert? And you might assume it to be something like speech-making, or oratory, or rhetoric, or the use of language to persuade, or whatever. And that is Gorgias's initial answer. But Socrates then says to him, You say that you understand the art of oratory and can make orators of others. What is the object with which oratory is concerned? Weaving, for example, is concerned with the production of clothes, is it not? Gorgias says yes. And music, with the creation of melodies? Yes. What is the, sorry, and what is oratory the knowledge of? And Gorgias says speech, okay? But here, Socrates puts a mas masterful question to Gorgias. He says, does medicine, which we mentioned just now, make men good at thinking and speaking about the sick? Gorgias says, necessarily. And so Socrates says, so it appears that medicine, too, is concerned with speech. Now what Socrates is pointing out here is that even if the orator can prove to be more persuasive than the masters of any given discipline, it won't be for the good. For instance, take something like physicians recommending a healthy diet. The confectioner the sugar man, the candy man, he has not mastered the art of health making to the same degree as a physician. If he had, he would be a physician. But in spite of that, the confectioner might be more persuasive than the physician. But if he is more persuasive than the physician, theoretically, it won't be for the good of the children, right? And to make this point clearer, Socrates shows Gorgias that there is a distinction between knowing and believing. And he says there can be false belief, but not false knowledge. And once he gets uh, Gorgias to sort of concede that point, it's easy from there to prove that rhetoric merely produces belief. Belief which can be true or false, and never knowledge. And so, demonstrably, it is a less reliable thing than any of the arts of which one might become a master. Now, as Socrates says, when the citizens hold a meeting to appoint medical officers or shipbuilders or any other professional class of persons, surely it won't be the orator who advises them then, right? So if you're going to build a big building or a new home or a town hall, or whatever, you're going to hire an architect, someone who has built a ship, or somebody who knows how to do something physically, not an orator. Now, Gorgias gives some interesting counterexamples here. One of them, he says something like, look, it is ultimately the orator, though, who determines 
sort of which things the town is going to build, you know, a, a, a harbor or a city hall or whatever. And so the orators run the world. He, I mean, and he's right in one sense, right? They, they do, the orators do get elected. They do get to run the TV channels and they do make commercials and they do sometimes become the president, right? I mean, was Trump an expert in international policy or in law or in anything that would make for a good president? Or was he just a good meme maker and messenger, messenger and rhetorician, sophist, right? He was the latter, needless to say. But Socrates isn't satisfied with that answer. Look at your screens and listen to this little exchange. Socrates, you say that you can make an orator of anyone who likes to learn from you. Gorgias says yes. And consequently, he will be able to get his way before a popular audience, not by, I should say, not by instructing in knowledge, but by convincing in belief. Gorgias says, certainly. Well, you said just now that even on matters of health, the orator will be more convincing than the doctor. Before a popular audience, yes, I did. Well, a popular audience means an ignorant audience, doesn't it? He won't be more convincing than the doctor before experts, I presume. Gorgias admits, true. Now, if he is more convincing than the doctor, he is more convincing than the expert. Naturally. Not being a doctor, of course. Of course not. And then Socrates says, and the non-doctor, presumably, is ignorant of what the doctor knows? Gorgias says, obviously. And Socrates says, so when the orator is more convincing than the doctor, what happens is that an ignorant person is more convincing than the expert before an equally ignorant audience. Am I right? And a few lines later, he drives this point home, saying to Gorgias, the orator need have no knowledge of the truth about things. It is enough for him to have discovered a knack of convincing the ignorant that he knows more than the experts. End quote. Man. When I first arrived at graduate school in uh, English in the fall of 2001, we had to take a class, English 501. It was like a welcome to graduate school class. And we spent all semester basically confusing ourselves, or at least that was the effect it had on me. We were assigned Foucault and Derrida and Lyotard and Baudrillard and uh, Kristeva and Linda Hutchin and Deleuze. Why all this stuff? Why a bunch of French mid-century theorists I never really understood why, to be honest. I mean, people were talking about that stuff, and I guess you have to read what people are talking about, but why were they talking about it, right? I, I do remember... So, you know, you have to take about three or four classes a semester in graduate school, and I remember at the same time I was taking this class in the 18th century British novel. And we were reading, at the beginning of the semester... I had been assigned in the 501 class Foucault's Discipline and Punish. Everybody had to read a different one of these theory books and like do a report on it. So Discipline and Punish was the book I read. And if any of you have read it, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's a reasonably interesting. It's the thing where the panopticon comes from and there's this talk about disciplining, you know, um, from like corporal punishment. It, it, they replace the corporal, the punishment of the body becomes re, uh, like replaced with the punishment of sort of the freedom of the mind, which is jail instead of, you know, public stocks. There's all this stuff in there, or about, like, drawing and quartering or whatever. I don't remember the book terribly well now, but, like, that was the idea. And so I had just read that at the beginning of the semester. First semester, I'm 23 years old. I've only read, like, 15 books in my life as an undergrad <laughs> English major. And uh, in, the, in the British novels class, we were reading this book by Richardson called Pamela. Franz knows it, I'm sure. And it was it's an epistolary novel, which means it's a novel in the form of like letters being exchanged. If I remember between like a maid 
I can't remember who she's writing to, like either her friend or something. And she's, I think she starts to maybe have an affair with like the master of the, the uh, chateau or something like that. And there's a scene in the book that my teacher was really interested in one day. So we're sitting around in a circle of, you know, 12, like most of them, young women and me, basically just kind of like going, why are we reading this shitty book about a dumb woman having an affair? Like, it seemed so irrelevant to me. I didn't enjoy it. And the teacher was like, you know, at one point she conjures up this scene from the novel where there's a scene that's something like the the young woman who's having an affair folds up a note or one of these letters and like put, puts it in her bustier or something close to her heart. And there's like some language about how she held the letter close to her heart. And the, the professor was like, what does this mean? You know, and no one could answer. Or they tried answers, and the professor was, like, not satisfied. And finally, I, I kind of was, like, you know, reluctant, raising my hand. And I go, I don't know if this is what you're interested in, but I'm reading that book by Foucault that everybody seems interested in called Discipline and Punish for this other class. And she, her eyes go, like, lit up, you know. And I go, and in that book, Foucault says something about how our writing can become a substitute for the body or something. And she's like, ah, oh. you know, she's quivering now. And I'm like, so maybe in this Richardson book, I guess there's something that where it's like this girl imagines that she's holding the letter, but it's really the body of her, you know, potential lover close to her heart. And like my professor basically had an orgasm. And I'm like, that's, and I honestly, like, She's over there gushing, and I'm sitting there going, like, why are you so excited? You know what I mean? There was a weird mix-up happening there. I guess, like, I didn't understand what happened. And, and like, I still, I still wonder about that. Maybe, I guess in my reflection, what happened is, you know, all the incentives were there for me to <clears throat> continue saying a bunch of nonsense that I didn't even really understand, right? All you have to do is kind of, it's this, like you're, there used to be that, uh, I'll, I'll pull it up I'll, if I can remember to do this. Make a mental note here. Mental note, pull up the, it's called the postmodern, I think it's called the postmodern gibberish generator or something like that. And it was this website you could just hit reload on and it would do like, it would do like a parody of the kind of writing that graduate students always did when they were writing these papers on theory. You know, and so it was like spin the wheel almost. It would be one of those 11 French theorists and then something about like, you know, like uh, situating or deconstructing or difference or whatever. And then something about, you know, gender or race or class or, you know, whatever. So it was just this like formula but no one, it, it's like it didn't mean anything. It never accomplishes anything. It just is sort of, it's just what you do, right? In my mind now, what I'm seeing now, 20 years, you know, with retrospect, is that like this was, this was, this was the devil tempting me with the world. Like, because meanwhile, while I stopped doing that as soon as I could get out of that English 501 class, there were a bunch of literally wearing fedora guys who continued to read Hegel and Foucault. No offense to Hegel either. I haven't even read Hegel, and he's not really one of the French theorists. But it was, it did seem like a lot of them were reading Hegel with their Foucault and their Deleuze and Derrida stuff. And I don't know, you guys. Like, I know a lot of you like them. I know E.V. likes reading some of them, and Franz likes reading Hegel, and I don't know. Postmodernism, I mean, in general, like, I get it. But the kind of writing that graduate students do about this stuff is bullshit. It is bullshit and it's bad for you because it's bullshit. Like it's, they're not telling the truth. You can tell by the fact that they like use their, you know, thesaurus in Microsoft Word just to like make stupid looking words with parentheses and bad puns and stuff. And it's like, it's, it's language games. That's all there is to it. So it, in some sense, like, this was the devil saying, you can have the world if you'll play this fake-ass game that we play in the way of dissent. Do you understand? The way of dissent is the way into the world. It's the way that you will be rewarded 
for sort of giving your graduate professors who are already like broken people the candy. You know, that's what it is. Maybe I'm too harsh on all these guys. I don't know. The, the point is all the incentives were there for me to say a bunch of nonsense and uh, kind of continue on that road. I, these people, the, the people who did wear the fedoras and talk about the French theorists, one thing I remember is that a lot of them, this was, I went to grad school, graduate school at a place where there was a big rhetoric program. And rhetoric, to me, it was like, why would anyone go into rhetoric? Like, there weren't really undergrads who got their majors in rhetoric. So who, who was it that was showing up at this program? There were a lot of people who had gotten their undergraduate degrees in English, which would be like reading, you know, novels mostly. And then you want to get into rhetoric. Well, what the heck is rhetoric? Like, what are you an expert in? Which is basically, you know, exactly what the main question of Gorgias is. I did have one friend, by the way. It's not everybody who's, you know, such an idiot like this. I mean, you know, remember Desmond Ford got his PhD in rhetoric, right? Like, there are people who seem to be earnest who are trying to get, like, you know, Cicero was a rhetorician. Like, there are people who use who study language and persuasion for the good, I suppose. Like, that is possible. It just seemed to me that most of these fedoras were the types of people who made fun of Socrates in, you know, Aristophanes' version of Socrates in the clouds or whatever. And they loved being atheists or, like, you know, like, lapsed Catholics. A lot of them were lapsed Catholics. They loved deconstructing anything classical or traditional. Everything was ironic. Always irony. Everything was a joke, sarcasm. Not even irony, but like sarcasm mostly. I remember like the, the, the these guys, at one point these guys started calling me. I used to, I used to like host. I didn't do this formally, but it people, I mean, and not to brag, you know, not to brag, but like I'm a talker. And so people who like to talk will sort of gather around sometimes. So I used to kind of hold court in this office where there were like, you know, 15 desks. They would put 15 people, uh, graduate students, all together in this room. And in this room, I, it was very interesting because, you know, you had people from all over the world here. I remember there were people from, you know, Turkey and uh, uh, what's that country to the east of India there, like Myanmar and Iran and uh, some part in Africa that I can't remember, and, uh, you know, whatever, Estonia and South America, and then a bunch of Americans, and we're all sitting around and, you know, talking about postmodernism a lot, or, or, uh, or the news of the day, or feminism, or Christianity in one way or another. And so I, I would have sometimes eight or ten people in this room, almost always it was me being the like, at the time, I didn't think I was a conservative. I thought I was like a uh, like, um, a true agnostic, you know, like I thought, although I was an atheist or I called myself that at the time, I wasn't a like Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris type of atheist. I was more like, I really wish I wasn't an atheist and I want to know what's going on, you know? And, and I was the kind of guy who like, I don't know, I would say like, I don't understand all this French theory helped me understand it. And then I would want to ask questions all day and they could never, I mean, I've, you know, th they never satisfied me. Okay, but this wasn't a posture. This wasn't me like playing a part. I wasn't trying to be Socrates. I hadn't even read Plato, I don't think, at that time. Because I remember when I was 23 that fall, one of these guys called me a Platonist. And I was like, what is that? Like a Platonist? How am I a Platonist? I haven't even read Plato. What do you mean by that? And he said something like, you know, well, you just, you believe in like the eternal forms or something. And I was like, what, what the hell, are, what are the eternal forms? Like, what are you talking about? I was, I was like, I just want to try to make sense of the world, you know, but they, they started calling me a Platonist. And then they started calling themselves sophists. And I was like, what's a sophist? Why are you a sophist? What is that? You know? And so then I, that was the semester I went and got this book, the Gorgias. And it took me a while to really understand it. I did have one friend, as I said, who was in rhetoric for the right reasons. He actually quit after his master's degree and went to become a lawyer like Cicero because uh, <clears throat> he felt that they were so full of shit in the re rhetoric and composition 
uh, discipline, the fake art of rhetoric, that it wasn't what he was looking for. But uh, uh, what was I going to say about him? There goes my guy with the pine straw is driving by. I got to stop him one of these days. But anyway, so like, you know, when you read the Gorgias, what comes into focus is this distinction between philosophers who practice the upward way, the way of ascent. The uh, what is the uh, remember in the Parmenides dialogue too? Well, actually, I haven't done the dialogue, but in Parmenides' poem, he talks about the way of truth. The way of truth. It's all the same thing, right? That we're talking about here. Well, any 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 reference to like truth with a capital T in graduate school was like almost it was like an embarrassment to these people. They would scoff at you and and tell you that you needed to study more. Uh, Derrida and didn't you understand about deconstruction and stuff. So that's where we were in 2001 and eventually what happens is you read you read Plato and and then you go bowling or to like you know basically like grad school cocktail parties with these self-described sophists and you're kind of faced with the choice. This is what happened to me is it's like okay is this is this guy who you know this loudmouth guy who he's he's getting a degree in, you know, he got an undergraduate degree in reading. I mean, pff, big deal, right, in English. And now he's getting a master's degree in rhetoric. And he's telling me, and we're both 24, you know, and he's telling me that, like, he's past Plato. You know, he's past all that. Even, he's past Aristotle. And, like, I don't know, man. So like, okay, you're past Aristotle and Plato. Like, tell me what you know. Convince me that you have wisdom, that you are the way. I Like, that I should live like you. You know what I mean? And uh, the only thing I'll say, like, maybe this is to my credit, they never convinced me. Like, they, they never, I, and it was like, I'm not even, that sounds like I'm like, haha, I won. But it's not that. It's just like, I, I was genuinely frustrated. At every one of these parties, I would go to these guys and go like, okay, like, but how am I supposed to live? Or I would say something like that. And, they, you know, it was always like, well, I can't tell you. Ha ha ha. Like, uh, you have to decide for yourself. And really, the decision is based on nothing because words don't mean anything. And, like, everything changes. And it's like, okay, well, I mean, that's completely useless to me. Also, it seems fake. I mean, there are givens in nature. There, there are hard limits as to what we can and can't do. And, I don't think uh, morality is totally fake. Maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it's somewhat of a control mechanism or something, but it also might be helpful in, like, navigating life or whatever. But you could never pin them down on anything. And ultimately, like, I'm, I got to a point where I followed deconstruction. I followed the logic of postmodernism close enough to something like nihilism that I was like, you know what, if that's all there is over here, you know, the, um, the, like, the kind of playful, like, they love terms like aporia in the, you know, in the non-mystical, non-shaman-like, non-spiritual, non-teleological, non-ends-driven sort of way. Just pure, like, confusion for the sake of confusion. And it's like, well, if that's all you're offering, and meanwhile, by the way, on the internet, I'm finding, you know, experts in like kundalini yoga, or I remember I was at the time I was reading uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti and the Theosophical Society or whatever, and they at least were promising psychic breakthroughs and like, you know, true transcendental revelations and stuff. Meister Eckhart, like at least there was that in that rhetoric, in that language a promise of <clears throat> yeah revelation or truth being revealed at the end somehow so i don't know how anyone would side with these um charlatans these mountebanks but um you know it, as that clip said from the wikipedia page like the mo the postmodern or the modern like yeah i would say basically the post french revolution view of these sophists is that like no actually they're sort of good, and Socrates went too far in shaming them. And really, Socrates himself was kind of like a sophist. They love to say that. It's like, because, yeah, Socrates used words, and therefore he's a sophist. It's like, no, because he's not using them 
to make money. Socrates was famously penniless and shoeless and ugly, and even his wife seemed to kind of hate him, and he was unpopular, and they killed him for it. And so one of the things that you can kind of uh, like bet on is that the people who are telling the truth, the real truth, who aren't using their language to, you know, bolster their own like social status or whatever, those people are sophists, right? But the ones who, sorry, I said it backwards, I guess. The people like Socrates who are trying to tell you the truth, those are the philosophers. Like I said yesterday on Twitter to Franz, I think, like Franz got to 200 followers and I'm like, careful, man. Because like, wh like, what's going on here? Have you, have you decided to sell out? I mean, two hundred followers, you know. But like, you look around and these people, like you know, Alex Kashuda or whatever, who've got their fifteen, twenty thousand followers. Are you really a philosopher, or are you doing some bullshit with your rhetoric that's just like kind of meant to titillate? You've got your picture of your pretty face there, and like that's why people are following you, you know. It's why, like, I sh you know what I should have done for this video? I'm not going to redo the whole thing because my voice is finished. Oh, here, look. This is perfect. You see this? A lot of times I'll shut this door because, you know, who cares? You don't want to see into my ugly, unpainted bathroom with the bottle of bleach up there. I'm glad it's there for this video. Bad optics. You know what I mean? So good. Hopefully, hopefully the people who like good optics too much left at the beginning of this video. You know? Oh, I shaved and like my neck is looking old and my new haircut's a little stern or something, bad optics. It's like, good, then maybe you left. It's the people who can see through all that stuff who are really listening for the content itself. Those are the ones you're going to reach. Those are the philosophers and they're going to keep their follower count down pretty low. You know, it's like, I want, I want a thousand devotees at the end of this whole ordeal that is the making of my channel. I don't know. I don't want, I don't need 30,000 people. Listen to me. That's too much. There's not 30,000 good people in the world. There's not anymore. There's a thousand. I want them to find me. That's who we want. These are the philosophers. Everybody else is an empty talker and uh, we want them to go away. These are the sophists. These are the Gorgiases of the world. They, by the way, they make the money. Oh, that reminds me. It's from, what is it, Matthew 10? I'll pull it up here real quick. It'll be right here in a minute. If I can remember this part, too. Make another mental note. My buddy, Late Empire, posted a tweet. And if if he he doesn't like to be doxxed or whatever, so if it's, if, it's, uh, if it's on private, I'll just retype it and put it up there. But the idea was, I think he was just quoting Matthew 10, I think, where Jesus says, you know, I have not come into the world to make peace. He's not a sophist, right? He says, look, people, this is going to cause people to hate each other. Basically, it'll be difficult. It's like, you know, all of this is related, right? The second half, I should have said more about this. The second half of the Gorgias is all about whether or not people should be empowered to do whatever they want, like Callicles thinks. And Socrates says no, because that's bad for them. Look at what happens if you leave kids unattended and free in the candy shop. They get diabetes. It's terrible for them. And so we need to <clears throat> make them come inside at 5 o'clock and eat a healthy dinner and go to bed on time and get up on time, study, you know, exercise, not watch too much TV. This is what we have to like sort of um, you know, force on them or else they end up unhealthy and disordered and degenerate and fat and uh, lascivious and all those vices, okay? But if you're the kind of parent who holds the line, I mean, how easy, you guys, those of you who have kids know that I'm right, how easy it is to be a sophist and just to give your kids the candy, give them an iPad, let them watch Dora all day on Netflix or whatever, simple. What's difficult is to play with them outside all day, make them read old books, and go to bed on time. I'm out of time. I could rail about this forever. The Gorgias is thin, easy to read, a great starter if you don't have time to get all the way through The Republic. Necessary reading. Talk to you next time on The Godward Podcast.